Hi, and welcome to the Starseed Kitchen Podcast. I'm your host, Chef Whitney Aronoff. And today I have the pleasure of interviewing Katie. And Katie, I've never asked you how to properly pronounce your last name. Oh my gosh, it's okay. No one says it correctly. It's Chevalier. Cheval- che- say, oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't speak French. I don't either, but it's the only French word I can say. It's Chevalier, but just say Chevalier. That's close enough. Chevalier. Chevalier. There we go. All right. So Katie Chevalier graduated with a bachelor's in nutrition and dietics from Cal State Long Beach. She completed her dietic internship at Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama in 2011. And Katie started working in long-term care in 2011 because that's the direction that she got offered a job and she wanted to get into clinical dietitian working right away. That allowed her an opportunity to do assessments um, and it's a niche that she really fell in love with. She has worked with over 10,000 patients in 10 years with all different conditions. In 2013, Katie became the director of food services for the skilled nursing facility she was working at and became a specialist in geriatric nutrition in 2016. In 2000, Katie became a certified colon hydrotherapist, further solidifying a more holistic approach to her nutrition philosophies. And as of this fall, she has moved on from long-term care nutrition to a role as a corporate dietitian and as a national menu director, supporting nursing homes and hospitals around the country. Well, welcome, Miss Katie. Thank you for having me today, Whitney. No, that was a, no, wow. I'm excited to chat with you um, because what I really wanted to talk to you about because of your nutrition background, um, your traditional and untraditional nutrition background, and your geriatric nutrition, long-term care nutrition, I feel like you probably come across a lot of different diet myths that you have to essentially quelch. Like so many people that have read magazines or watched things on the news or in media that they believe is what will make them healthy. And from your education, you have to um, help them understand why that's actually the opposite approach that they should take. 100%. It happens constantly. So we all have opinions. Okay. And our opinions can come from the time we're, you know, children from our parents, from anything that we're exposed to. And most importantly, nowadays, what people are constantly bombarded with is the internet, yeah, social media. And so people are getting information from all these sources. We don't know if they're good sources, if they're actually even factual or not. And so one of the first things that is a struggle you know, being a clinical dietitian, when you meet a new patient at a hospital or you're working with a client, it doesn't matter what their condition is or what they're interested in learning. They already have preset beliefs and opinions, usually based off of something they learned on the internet or what their favorite celebrity is doing or what their trainer told them to do. And so there is so many myths. We can go through some of my least favorite ones, um, but that's something that I always have to do. I kind of have to ask my clients or the, you know, the patients at the hospital to be open-minded, be willing to accept new information, be willing to possibly unlearn what you believe is true. Because if you're having health problems or you're not in a, the most healthy state that you want to be, obviously you can do something better and whatever you're practicing at this time might not be the best for you. Or maybe it never even was a healthy thing for you to be doing in the first place. I myself am guilty of it and have personally tried many things that I do not believe in anymore because I wanted to understand where my clients were coming from. Yeah. Well, the best way to learn is to try it on yourself, you know? Oh yeah. And that's a great way to learn what really serves your body and what doesn't serve your body. And, um, cause there's a lot of great tips out there that just not might not be right for your body, but there's a lot of information out there that can actually get you sick. I'm so glad that you said that too, because what works for you might not work for me and what works for this client won't work for this client. So not practicing a one size fits all approach has always been something that's very important to me. So talking about diet myths. um, Yeah. So some of the biggest ones that people come to me with have been the, I know you've heard it 10,000 times. We all have that carbs are bad for you. It's my biggest pet peeve in the world, because as you know, Whitney, um, you're no new to nutrition not all carbs are created equal. It's something that we're taught, 
you know, at the, when you go to school to become a dietitian, the first big lesson they go over is your macronutrients. So you learn about carbs, fats, and proteins, and your body needs all of them, period. Carbs are essential. You need them. And what is a carb? Um, fresh organic strawberries are a carb. Yes. White bread, wonder white bread that's not the healthiest is a carb. Um, maple syrup is a carb. Alcohol is a carb. Well, there's carbs in it. So not all carbs are created equal. And so therefore, how can you lump them all together and say that they make you fat, they're bad for you, they cause this, they cause that. So that's my number one biggest pet peeve. I myself, I'm a smaller frame. I have struggled with my weight when I was younger, actually, but um, I eat a very well-balanced diet and I do a ton of carbs and I can happily say I've maintained a healthy body weight for the past 15 years, eating a normal amount of carbohydrates. I don't nitpick. I can't have them. I can't have this. I just try to stay away from the ones that I don't believe are as nutritious and healthy for you. So you stick with whole food carbs. So would you say, you know, like potatoes, parsnips, celery root, um, fruit, um, oh, yeah. ancient grains, like, you know, rice, quinoa, millet. I do not keep and I, okay. I do not keep white bread sitting on my counter and bake sugar cookies and yeah, eat, make myself pancakes every morning. Now, yeah. with that being said, I don't want anyone to think that I don't like those things because God knows I wish I could eat crusty sourdough bread covered in butter at every meal because it's absolutely delicious, but we'll get into the reason why I don't eat those things often yes. in my home. I eat a ton of fresh fruits. I think it's so important. Eat the rainbow literally because every different colorful food provides different nutrients and antioxidants for our body, which we know help us not age as quickly. They prevent disease. They can prevent free radical damage, which leads to cancer. There's just endless reasons why we should be doing that anyways, but eating fresh fruit, having a green juice, potatoes. How many times have you heard people say potatoes are bad for you? They're cheap, inexpensive, wonderful foods that are fiber rich and they're filling and they're delicious. Should you deep fry them and dip them in ranch dressing? No, it's good once again, but don't do that often, but they're, they're good for you. Yeah. So different kinds. There's so many varieties. Absolutely. I mean, and they all taste different and you can use them differently in different applications. So potatoes, I eat them. I had them last night for dinner actually with my favorite food, which we'll talk about later that you introduced me to. Um, but yeah, potatoes. Um, when I do buy bread, it's usually for a special occasion. I try to buy a very like organic, fresh one from a bakery or something that's made with very high quality ingredients. Um, no bleached flour nonsense. Um, I do a lot of quinoas. Um, what else do I have? I'm staring at something right now and I'm blanking on the name. But um, yeah, a lot of ancient grains that you've talked about, I started using um, instead of, I'm obsessed with pasta. So instead of trying to buy the standard cheap gluten wheat pasta, I've been trying to buy different varieties. So like the red lentil ones I really like now that are high in protein. There's a cassava one. Yes, my jovial. Yes. Yes, you introduced me to that and it's amazing. I mean- food has come such a long way. So if you are trying to avoid some of the starches and carbohydrates that are not as good for us, then the good news is, is that you have so many new varieties nowadays available to that taste great. So we have so many more options to eat healthier. Yeah. And there's so many other carbs that are seasonal. Like right now, it's a great time to use spaghetti squash in place of pasta or, you know, roast kabocha squash or, Um, that there's just so many out there that are seasonal right now and they're considered carbs. So there's, there's really a lot of options and your body needs it and it's great fuel. Um, and you just, and they taste delicious Yeah, and, and you figure out the ones that make you feel good. Exactly. It's just a balance, you know, trying to, if you're craving authentic spaghetti and meatballs, go have them one night, but try to get the best quality ones you can, and then get back on your health wagon and you know, try to make healthier options. Like you said, make a spaghetti squash one, one night, use yeah. the zucchini zoodles from scratch. It's fun. It tastes different. It's more colorful and it's healthier for you. 
Well, and we're just living at a time in the United States where when you go out to eat spaghetti and meatballs, unfortunately, it's made with a lot of processed ingredients. And that's not the fault of the restaurant or the cooks that are following the recipes. Um, Neither are paying close attention to what they're actually putting in the food. So they don't realize that the breadcrumbs that they're using in their meatballs aren't just breadcrumbs. There are about 15 different ingredients and none of them are going to be fully processed in your body. They're all going to stay there for a very long time because they're all chemical laden. Um, And the quality of the pork and the beef is the lowest quality pork and beef that you never want to put in your body. It's, it's not necessarily grass fed. Um, And this is different than if you were in Europe or another part of the country, but most restaurants, the quality of the ingredients they're using are just not up to par. And so that's why it's so important to learn how to make your favorite meals at home. So you can choose the ingredients. So the ground beef that you purchase is 100% grass-fed, grass-finished, 80-20 ground beef. And 80-20 means 80% protein, 20% fat. You want a 20% fat in your ground beef. You never want to buy like a 90, 10, cause it's no. going to dry and have no flavor. And it's also not going to make you, as you know, satiated because there's going to be no fat there. So you really need to enjoy restaurants to figure out what you love and then learn how to make it at home where you can control the quality of the ingredients. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you mentioned that, you know, like you said, in restaurants defense, now I'm working in like more of a food procurement position Mm -hmm. and we won't get off on this tangent, but with COVID and supply chain issues, you know, the the price of food costs have gone up. So restaurants are going to struggle with that even more. And unfortunately, a lot of the processed foods and the over-processed meats and all these other things, breadcrumbs, they're going to become more prevalent and they're cheaper. So we, as the consumers need to be even more aware of this. And as, since you brought up that meat thing, that was another myth that I wanted to bring up that I hear all the time. Um, I eat all different types of food. I don't, I'm not, I'm an anti-diet dietitian. Um, I think that I eat all meats, I eat vegetables, I eat fruits. I include some dairy. I try not to eat too much of it. Um, We'll get into why later, but the excessive push of animal proteins in our culture everyone thinks they need to have this like big chunk of meat at every meal. And I don't believe that that's necessary. I would say I have a vegetarian meal at least once a day and not even because I'm trying to avoid the meat. It's just not how I think we were intended to eat. Um, I love beef. I love high quality cuts of pork. I like seafood. I like chicken. I like all of it, but eating the highest quality, like you said, you know, going to like a butchery, like a local butcher that's having higher quality meats where the animals are treated well, not pumped with antibiotics and hormones. Of course, if an animal is sick when it dies and you eat it, it's not healthy for you. So (laughs) I just believe eating smaller amounts of that, and I'm going to bring this up, a super simple diet tip that I teach people when they're resistant to education, or I can tell they're tuning out quickly. It's probably one of the simplest genius things that they ever came out with was something called the plate method, in my opinion. And once again, it's simple. It's not necessarily something that I would teach to you, but for simple lesson, if people just looked at a plate method, 50% of your plate should be covered in vegetables, period. And only a little bit needs to be meat and a little bit high quality starch. And if everyone ate like that, you would be healthier. You would not have as much chronic disease in this world. And you just don't need a lot of meat. Just eat a little bit of it because it's delicious and we need protein, but you don't need to have this 20 ounce ribeye on your plate. That's just a great reminder for anyone who's looking to make a shift in the new year to just take a look at their plate and they make sure that 50% of it is filled with vegetables. Yep. It's, it's so easy. That's why I love it. It takes the science out of it. I mean, I could get into super, you know, clinical scientific pathways that will bore the average person and it's too much information, but I try to teach people that all the time in the hospital before they're leaving. Can you just help me? It doesn't matter if they're diabetic, they had heart conditions, whatever it is. I go plate method. Here's a super simple diagram. You can print it out online. The typical government one has a cup of milk and fruit on the side. You don't have to do that. I don't push that. I just say plate, half veggies, a little bit of high quality protein, 25% high quality protein, 25% high quality complex carbohydrate. If you do that, you're golden. Like you're going to have a better 
you know, distribution of calories, fiber, water, vegetables tend to be lower in calorie, lower in saturated fat. So it's just healthy and simple. And they'll so. hydrate the body as well, as you know, since yes. the colon hydrotherapy background, you know, the importance of hydrating the body through elements other than just drinking water. Yes, it's huge. So I know you touched base on why I became a colon hydro. Well, I became a colon hydrotherapist about a little over a year ago now. It's been so eye opening. And so I'm 37 and I actually got my first colonic when I was 19. Um, during COVID, when healthcare got a little depressing, I decided, you know, I want to learn something new and where can, where should I go? Um, that's not going to take me 10 years to go to school. And it dawned on me, oh my gosh, I'm going to become a colon hydrotherapist. I get them regularly. I believe in them. I think they're so important to keeping the body healthy. Um, and the reason why is because working in nursing homes for over 10 years, I can tell you at least 90% of the clients that come in there are on a laxative. Really? Daily. Are you oh, serious? absolutely. Wait, so when they come to the nursing home, have they already been consistently on a laxative or is it the nursing home putting them on a laxative? It's a combination of both. So, you know, nine most of the time, residents that are coming, that are coming into the nursing home and I'm assessing they came from the acute hospitals. So a big hospital and they came down to us as a state, a step down unit. So they could be on it because they just had a surgery and you're usually prone to constipation after surgery because of the anesthesia, it makes your gut kind of stop moving. Yeah. So typically a doctor will prescribe a laxative after a surgery because to get things going, because it's very normal to become constipated after surgery. Um, I can speak for myself. I've, I've had, after I got my wisdoms done and I was put out, I'm a very regular bowel movement taker. It didn't have one for three days. Guess what I did? I went and got a colonic because I was miserable and didn't want to take laxatives, Yeah. but okay. So they come in, if they had surgery, that reason, otherwise many of them were already on them at home. I would actually, I'll say seven out of 10 of my patients take laxatives regularly at home. Wow. And it's not usually just one. It could be a combination of a stool softener, a laxative. Some people are taking milk of magnesia every single day. And they're telling me they go every five to seven days. You and I both know that's not normal. Just so you know, Ayurvedic medicine, which is more homeopathic medicine, but we say that you should have a bowel movement for every meal, but a minimum of two to three a day. Okay. In the hospital setting, and I'm not trying to bash Western medicine, but if you take a bowel movement every three days, they consider that you're not constipated. So that is not right. You should not be taking a bowel movement every three days yeah. and not trying to make anyone feel bad. That's not going that often. If anything, listen to this podcast and try to improve your frequency. Okay. Cause you're not alone. Many people don't go regularly. Um, so that's what made me want to become a colon hydrotherapist. Um, I, so I work with all different types of clients, clients that are super healthy clients, that have healthy backgrounds go regularly and they're just doing it to maintain their health. And then clients that have conditions and issues going on and they thank goodness found colon hydrotherapy and they're trying to improve their conditions. So it's extremely hydrating and that doing that job and working with so many people now, I ask them about their diet history and what they eat. And I can tell when I see the output in the colonic tube I absolutely can tell if they are healthier eaters versus if they are not eating as healthy, in my opinion. Wow. So if somebody tends to eat high animal protein, high refined carbohydrates, their stool absolutely looks different and they do not have as much come out as if somebody eats more fruits, more vegetable, or like a higher plant-based diet, not vegetarian, just more plants. So would you because say- a healthy stool is dark brown and green and an unhealthy school stool is light brown and yellow. Most of the time, however, remember foods can, of course, alter our color. If yeah. you ate a ton of beets and you come in and have red coming out of your chronic, you're not dying. It's yeah. the beets. Yes, and will. also, yes, it's happened to me and I've forgotten I've eaten beets and panicked. Um, and also like carrot juices, carrot juices mm -hmm. can change them. If you're on certain medications, but typically speaking, um, some of my healthiest clients tend to have dark green, green and darker brown stools. Yes. And the consistency is different. I notice people that eat poor diets and they'll openly admit it to me, have stickier stool that will 
be streaky. It leaves like a residue. Yeah. It's because it's, it's processed food. It's not, it's not real food that's going through. And so when I say processed food, like, what does that mean? So when you go to the grocery store and if we were to go back to breadcrumbs, you know, breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs should literally be dried leftover bread, essentially pulverized into little crumbs. And Mm -hmm. the only ingredient should be what that bread was made out of, which should be a whole wheat or an unbleached wheat flour, water, maybe egg, um, a little sugar, depending, I mean, depending all on the bread recipe, sea salt, not many ingredients. But when you look at a breadcrumb package nowadays, there's like 15 ingredients. I'll be like polysorbate this, maltodextrin, food coloring. Yep, MSG, dioxide, something. Like it's all these words that you can't pronounce. So none of them came from nature citric acid. They're all chemicals that are added to make something shelf stable. So you could buy those breadcrumbs and they can be there for five years without getting moldy. That's scary. Yeah. And so that's in your colon and in, and in your tissue and it's in every cell of your body. Yep. It's frightening. Uh, you know, frightening because you can't control when this is going to be in your food, because not everyone's looking at the ingredients. Absolutely. You know, I think about, so foods that I would not recommend putting in your body often, obviously processed foods, because of what you just said, we don't know what these chemicals are going to do to our bodies. And the government will of course study these chemicals and they'll say, you know, they're not toxic because they, you know, in small amounts, your body can process everything, which that's true. But the problem is, is that they're in so many foods now. And the average American is eating those foods on a daily basis. It's just like diet Coke. I think it's terrible for you with soda in general, but if you have one a year, I don't think it's going to do anything to you, but the average person that drinks diet Coke doesn't drink one a year. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not, t- you know, not trying to make anyone feel bad, but let's reflect. If you do this, <laughs> if you drink, I know a dear friend that is healthy besides this. And I always get after him drinks like three to four diet Cokes a day. No way. Just have a shot of espresso. Oh, we won't get into that. Right. Exactly. But three to four diet Cokes a day. Now that has a cumulative effect. Yeah. You can say, well, Katie, you know, just having a little bit of a spartame or whatever the artificial sugar is in diet Coke now having, you know, one in a, one in a blue moon, is that going to hurt me? No, it's just like having a glass of wine here and there isn't a big deal. But if you have two bottles at night, we have an issue now. So if you're going to consume these artificial ingredients and these chemicals excessively, of course, it's going to have an effect on you. Your body can only process so much. Isn't that, so I recommend staying away from it. If you love potato chips, don't go buy ruffles. I know they taste good. They're my favorite junk food, but I would never get out of my house because I can't stop make a homemade potato chip, use high quality oil, make, make a little batch, enjoy it and move on with your life. But if you don't want to make homemade potato chips and you live in Southern California. There is a steakhouse in Beverly Hills called Wolf Gangs. Now there's two steakhouses in Beverly Hills called Wolf Gangs. One is Wolf Gangs for Wolf Gang Puck and the other is Wolf Gangs and it's on Cannon. And that's the one you want to go to. They make homemade potato chips. Oh, yummy. You can sit at the bar before you go and sit at your table for your steak dinner and have the homemade potato chips. I could care less about potato chips. I could go the rest of my life and never be given a potato chip. And I could <laughs> laugh. not my thing, but these are amazing and they come out hot. Oh, I love it. They're absolutely delicious. So that's, that's a nice thing to try. And then also, I don't know, do you ever have smashed potatoes? Do you ever make those at home? I love them. Yeah, they're a good substitute and a more health supportive option if you're someone that likes potato and crispy and salt. Oh yeah, all of the, all of my favorite things. And I'm Dutch, so I don't even want to say this. This is embarrassing, but I don't do it. But my favorite is dipping what you just said and then adding mayonnaise. I I knew you were gonna say that. So well, hey, don't feel guilty about your guilty pleasures because I have them too, and I'm a dietitian. That's yeah, like the you can make homemade mayo with for sure. You can buy really good pasture raised eggs. So that egg yolk is super orange and you could mix it with avocado oil or 50 avocado, 50% olive oil, sea salt, Dijon, and make your own mayo. 
post me a healthy mayonnaise recipe on your website and I will start making it seriously. Okay. We'll do that. <laughs> and maybe I'll try it the Dutch way of my smashed potato in a little homemade mayo. We'll see how oh, that goes. you can't, you can't go wrong with that. Yeah. Um, it's anyways, it's so good. I don't want to get on a tangent about that. Sorry. Mayonnaise isn't the topic today, Katie. <laughs> Since you have a really interesting background of being a clinical nutritionist and a colon hydrotherapist, um, what are foods that you do suggest that people eat more often um, so they feel good, have regular bowel movements, um, are more hydrated? Okay. Have, I believe, so this is not something I learned in college, actually. I now take what I learned in college and I use a lot of it. A lot of it was great information. I don't agree with all of it. And then when I went to school to become, become a colon hydrotherapist, I learned some Ayurvedic things that I believe. Mm -hmm. So every morning I wake up and I have something like a fresh piece of fruit or fruit juice that's fresh, some type of green juice or something. Cause I believe that's kind of like a tonic elixir for my body. It starts everything off right. And then I have my coffee, whether you like that or think that's healthy or not people. I love my coffee, drink good quality coffee, but, yeah. um, have fresh fruit. And I think having it by itself is super important because it's very enzyme rich. So whatever you ate the day before, I kind of think of it as it goes into your body and it's eating up all the crud that's left over. So it's a good way to start your day. I like bacon and eggs. I get it, but don't start your day with bacon and eggs. First thing when you wake up, unless it's a special occasion, cause it's not cleansing you of anything. I think that's a good idea. Number one, number two, eat vegetables with every meal, especially when you're having animal protein, because vegetables are high in fiber and high in water, along with antioxidants and vitamins and minerals. But when you're eating the animal proteins, which we also need, there's wonderful, beautiful amino acids and proteins in them. They also have saturated fat and cholesterol, however, and you don't want to consume too much of that because it's associated with heart disease, colon cancer, et cetera. So when you eat it with vegetables that are high in fiber, it can actually help bind with the saturated fat and help carry it out of your body, limiting the absorption of the things in it that are not good for us. Okay. Um, when you eat whole grains, I don't believe the old school food pyramid. You do not need six to 11 servings a day. That's a little excessive, but eat high quality ones. Don't be afraid of it. Especially if you're craving it. I believe in intuitive eating. If your body's telling you, you really need something, you might need a nutrient that's in that food. I know certain times of the month, I want beef more than others. It's probably for a reason and listen to your body. Isn't that interesting? Totally agree. There's only one week a month where I really want red meat. Oh, I, I crave it bad. And I also notice if I'm working out a little bit more, I crave it. And if I'm running more and I come up with all these theories in my head, I don't know if they're true, but, um, there's something called like runner's anemia. So your feet actually, because they're, especially if you're running outside on hard asphalt, your, some of your blood vessels can actually pop. So you can get runner's anemia. I don't believe I have that, but when I go on my running binges for like two weeks and then I stop, I'll notice by week two, I'm craving more red meat. So I do believe in intuitive eating, listen to your body. Um, so yeah, I said fruit in the morning, vegetables at all meals, at least lunch and dinner, um, try to have at least one of those meals incorporate raw vegetables, like a salad every day or whatever. You can use any type of, you know, leaf lettuce you want. Look on Whitney's webpage. She has so many beautiful salad recipes, change them up, try new vegetables, make them colorful eat high quality protein. But one thing you need to remember about protein, protein does not help you go to the bathroom. When you learn about digestion of food, protein, fat, and carbs are pretty, they're the only macronutrients or types of food that your body digests. All foods fall into one of those categories, period. And when protein is metabolized, you lose two water molecules. So it's actually dehydrating. Something to remember. So I'm not going to go off on a tangent and go on my opinions on all diets, but if you're on a high protein diet, low carb, or you're on a keto diet, you need to increase your fiber rich water vegetables or the fluids that you're drinking period. Because if you eat too much meat, you'll become dehydrated and you are prone to constipation period. And if you're prone to constipation, then you're not getting the toxicity out of your body, not oh. just the food that you're eating, but the cellular waste, the emotional yes. waste everything that you're breathing in, everything you're putting in your skin. Um, it's just another blocked elimination valve. And so that's how you create sickness and disease. 100%. And, you know, getting, if you're not going to the bathroom and you have tons of like, that's gross to think about, but like a bunch of old food stuck in you, your body, your large colon, the last part of 
your you know, GI tract that holds stool before we go. If you're constipated and you got a bunch of old stool in there, the main function, there's three main functions of your large colon to absorb water out of your food. When you drink water, it's not getting absorbed by your stomach or your small intestine. It's your large colon period. So it's got to get all the way down there. So when food leaves your small intestine and goes into your large intestine, it's liquid. It's in a form we call chyme. And by the time it gets to the, the other side of your large colon, when it's almost ready to come out is when it's formed whole stool. But when it first enters, it's liquid. So it's absorbing. So if you have old stool, it just keeps absorbing all of the junk that's sitting in your gut festering, which is not good. And then it's a holding stool for stool and it absorbs some, a few minerals and things. So the main thing is it's what hydrates us. So if things aren't moving, you are prone to becoming dehydrated also. Yeah, it's, which is why I like colon hydrotherapy because we're literally putting water inside of there, obviously cleaning you out, getting rid of stool that doesn't need to be there. And we are hydrating the body and a hydrated colon is a healthy colon. And then back to foods that you should eat. So like I said, protein, we need it, but if you're going to eat a high amount of it or you're on a high protein diet of some sort, increase fluids, either in the form of water or um, fiber rich and water rich vegetables. Limit caffeine because it's dehydrating, limit alcohol because it's dehydrating and eat healthy fats. Your body needs those too. So yeah. Oh, and limit dehydrated foods. Yeah. I'm not a fan of them. And I'll tell you, this is a quick thing. I don't tell me if I'm taking up too much time. It's super interesting. Yeah. I tend to be one of those people that I fall in love with a certain food and I eat it excessively for a couple of weeks. And then I'm like, okay, I don't want to look at it again for a while. I went on a kick shoot five years ago where I made this like cold oatmeal, Greek yogurt, berry concoction. I'd make whatever every single morning. And I covered one of the layers with dried cranberries. I ate that every single day because it was so good for, I swear, a month straight. Yeah. And I had a colonic in maybe two months, went to get a colonic and I'm sitting on the table. My aunt was in the room actually, cause she was deciding if she wanted to have a colonic. And all of a sudden I'm like, not listening to the colon hydrotherapist. He was a friend or my aunt. And I'm like, what is coming out of me? What are those things? And the lady turns around and looks at it and she goes, I don't know. And you, you know, when you're looking at a colon hydrotherapy tube, yeah. it's all lit up. We should show that one day. Um, and you can see the food particles and the colors coming out of you. And she goes, I don't know. It's some type of food. You have so many of them coming out of you. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, hundreds of dried cranberries are coming out of me. Whole, whole. So this was so unbelievable hundreds. So first of all, this is a whole other topic, man. I need another podcast, but if I didn't ever do my master's, but I always said after that, if I ever went on to do my master's, my thesis would be that nutrition, why nutrition, are nutrition labels accurate? And my thesis would be no. And this would be a prime example, yeah. dried cranberries that give you an exact, um, all nutrition labels give you the caloric amount, protein, blah, 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 blah. We've all seen nutrition labels based off of in a lab, they take the food and they burn it down till it's like black sulfur dust. Our body doesn't do that. I know that's our body I does not do that. So yes. it's a great tool. It's, I get it. It's nice to be able to say this is approximately hundred calories. And it, as a dietitian, that's very useful information, but realize it's not 100% accurate period. And your body doesn't burn food into dust. And I've, I've been in the lab and had to figure out when I burn broccoli and you figure out and you do get close, but that's not what your body does. So it's a prebiotic. There's no calories in it. If you're not breaking it down and it's coming out whole. And that also concerns me because if I wouldn't have put, had a colon hydrotherapy, a colon hydrotherapy session that hydrated my colon, how long would have all that been stuck inside of me? And I will tell you this TMI embarrassing, but I was extremely gassy before that um, it, yeah. session. It wasn't coming out of me. I had these dried old cranberries sitting inside my gut and I was literally tooting a lot and yeah. didn't feel right. It felt you, so much better after that colonic. I think last time I saw you, for some reason, there was, was a picture of a colon on a wall and you were showing me how gas builds up because the, the air essentially gets in between spots where there's food in the colon trying to break down. 
So yep. when you have food in the colon, it's trying to break down, but it's stuck. And then there's air comes along and then more food and then air and food and air. And that's not supposed to happen. It's simply because you're eating food that isn't easily digestible. That and, or it has slow transit time. It's taking too long to come out of you, or you got ate something bad and it's stuck and not coming out. And even if you ate something healthy, it's like this thing's dehydrated and taking longer to come out. Plus stool has bacteria in it and bacteria are living just like us and they eat and they have output. So they have poop and gas. So the longer things are stuck inside of you, it would be safe to say you'll probably become more gassy and bloated and not feel well. Amazing. Yeah. So there was one more thing I was going to bring up on that topic because it was interesting. And now I'm blanking because I went off on the dried cranberry tangent. No, I love <laughs> the dried cranberry tangent. I mean, it's uh, interesting because I know that you work with Jeannie Martin and Jeannie always reminds me how terrible it is to eat dried fruit. Um, yes. Because, you know, all the, all the, all the water has been taken out of it. They just don't. Okay. Let's put it this way. I hate saying bad foods, good foods, or this food's evil. Cause I hate that so many, every, everyone I talk to has had some unhealthy relationship with food at one point in their life. I'd rather have you eat a dried cranberry than eat like a, a flaming hot Cheeto, <laughs> but it's, we eat for enjoyment, but we also have to eat to nourish our body. And what does it need? What does it want? And if you're not getting anything out of it at all, it's literally stuck inside of you, causing you to become gassy and bloated until you luckily get it to come out of you. What was the point? Ooh, well said. Yeah. If food doesn't make you feel good, that's one thing I will say I'm getting better at as I get older. I don't eat perfect. I have bad weeks. I started a new job. I haven't been working out the same, which throws my bowels off and obviously my eating off. Um, but I get back on it, but I have gotten better with, and everyone should think about this more. If you eat something and it makes you feel terrible after stop eating it. Yeah. And we, we, it, Whitney, we have these conversations, some things that affect you don't hurt me. Remember I told you mine, mine's so weird, spicy tuna, which I try not to eat that anyways anymore, because I think tuna is going endangered and I feel too bad for the tunas, blah, blah, blah. We won't even get into that. But when I used to be into sushi years ago, if I ate spicy tuna from any sushi bar, it didn't matter if it was the most expensive one or the crappy place on the corner, upset stomach, bad for days. Why? Other was, people could eat it and they're fine. Well, it was probably, it has nothing to do with the tuna itself. It has to do with the mayo that they're mixing it with. Okay. And ingredients of the mayo. Um, and that, that mixture, that's but, probably why. And then this food combination, which is super depressing pizza, I can eat bread by itself. If it's high quality and I can eat cheese by itself. Cheese does not upset my stomach. If I eat too much of it, it will bind me up. But if I eat them together and I have two or three pieces on a gluttonous night, I won't poop for a day and a half. Oh, interesting. You mentioned, I'm sorry if I'm just spreading yours, but chocolate will throw you off sometimes. Oh yeah. Chocolate and well, obviously soy. Soy is my kryptonite. Me too. Uh, that's like poison. I'm ill for three days. I mean, it's horrible. Um, but chocolate seems to not work for me anymore. See? And that's why when people say, so what diet would you recommend for people? I'm like, I don't do that because everyone's different. I just say things that I think you should push. And it's even working at Jeannie's place, Jeannie is such a wealth of knowledge. I've learned so much from being a colon hydrotherapist at her, at her job, at her business. So many interesting clients with different tolerances to food. And I literally have clients that are like, oh, I can't eat pineapple. It destroys me. I can eat pineapple all day long. It's like a high enzyme fruit. If anything helps make me feel cleaned out. Why does it hurt them? I don't know. I'm not inside their body. I don't know what's going on. Same thing with dairy. I can eat, like I said, I don't drink milk. It's not my thing, but I could have a couple pieces of cheese every day and I would, nothing bad would happen to me. Other people get terrible gas, stomach aches, everything. So you really need to listen to your body. And when things feel good, eat more of them. Oh, that's a really great reminder. Cause we're always talking about the things to avoid and yeah. reminding ourselves that when we find things that really make us feel good, just keep at it, keep enjoying them and maybe find more varieties of them. 
So are there any new foods or that any new foods or cooking techniques that you've um, added into your life over the past year that you're really enjoying? So I don't know, maybe vegetables that you never cooked before or um, when I mean new foods, I don't mean new shelf stable products, but just, you know, enjoying food in new ways that maybe you haven't before. So my mom got me an air fryer last Christmas and I am obsessed with it. I am absolutely obsessed with it. I think everyone should own one. It is a miracle and it makes everything taste amazing. I am obsessed. And just, you know, they go on sale every year at Williams Sonoma and answer Latab for like 30, 40% off because they're very there. You can get cheaper ones too. So you don't need to get an expensive one, but the top of the line Breville ones go on sale for like 40% off. I use it every single day. I eat, put my asparagus in there. You can make crispy sweet potato French fries and potato French fries and all delicious potato things. My favorite food. I'm seriously not even trying to advertise for you right now, but I cannot help myself. It's shelf stable, but buy this because it's the best thing in the entire world. I am obsessed with it. Um, Thank you, Katie. Oh my gosh. No, it's seriously Roland and I are going to turn into Jadori chicken thighs because we eat them four nights a week. I just always eat chicken breast, I guess, because I'm a dietitian and it's like, it's lower in saturated fat, blah, blah, blah. And I always bought high quality meat, but a chicken thigh, especially with the skin on, yes, it might be higher in fat, but it's also higher in different nutrients. And because it's higher in fat, you get more satiety out of it and it's richer and you don't need to eat as much to feel full. Isn't so it? there's two ways to look at it, right? Yeah. You either can eat a five ounce, big, gigantic chicken breast, or I can have one chicken thigh with the skin on and it's so just juicy and delicious and satisfying and I am so happy. And then when you throw this on there, oh my gosh, you don't even need to add any additional fat. And then in the air fryer, the skin gets all crispy and you literally feel like you're doing something bad. And oh, they're amazing. And we are lucky enough to have a butchery very close to us. I know Whitney's a fan of the butchery too. If you live local in Southern California, there's one in Costa Mesa, Newport and Brea, correct? Mm -hmm. They have very high quality meats and they're Jadori chicken thighs. Everyone is looking after their finances right now too. I know, unfortunately, a lot of healthy food can be expensive and that's not something that everyone can do right now. I'm very sympathetic to that. Um, I don't want to sit here and be like, buy organic blueberries and this all day long because not everybody can afford to do that. They are inexpensive. We just got six yesterday for 12 something, six for $12. That's, that's cheap. And it, that's th at least three meals for me because I don't eat more than two ever. Yeah. Um, they're so good. That is my favorite food. That's what I've been doing like crazy. And a new food that I actually just started cooking that I had never cooked until I talked to you, I did beets. I have just been on a beet kick. I, I just did it one time, the yellow ones, because I didn't want the red ones to stay in my counter, but I watched your podcast and I did it. And I love beets. I just never eat them at home. I eat them at restaurants because I'm afraid they're going to ruin my kitchen, but they were so easy and they're so good for you. Yeah. And it's so nice to be able to then enjoy them the way that you want to. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I really love them with a little balsamic vinegar and olive oil, salt and pepper with arugula, like just keep it really simple. Um, and I love the golden beets as well with a bunch of chopped up celery and other so veggies. Good. They're so good. So good. I want to, now I'm going to go off on a tangent. I do want to bring this up because we talked about some like sample questions we might talk about. And I thought it was really important being a dietitian and being a colon hydrotherapist, I do want to say, if you are having problems going to the bathroom regularly, because this has become one of my fortes, um, and you're already doing all the things that Whitney and I already talked about, you're already eating the foods that I mentioned and avoiding, you know, excessive dehydrated foods and too much caffeine, and you still can't go, please don't start taking laxatives. I understand if it's like an emergency situation, but they really, your body will become dependent upon them like anything else, and they'll stop working. They mess with how your intestines and your, I'm sorry, your colon is intended to work. They will dehydrate you. They cause electrolyte imbalances. And now you have the same problems with new ones. So if you have to take something, beets help you go to the bathroom. And if you don't like the way they taste, because I hear people complain about this all the time, they sell tons of beet supplements. I'm not trying to get everyone to sell them from, buy them from me, but 
Vitratox is an amazing, amazing brand. And there's tons of other wonderful brands you can go get at Whole Foods, you know, um, Mothers, plenty of places have them, but find one that works for you. If I notice, if I like have a gluttonous night, we went to a Christmas party the other night and I had a big piece of carrot cake. See, I splurge. And I was like, oh, that's probably not going to help me go to the bathroom tomorrow. I took four of my beet pills the next morning. Boom. It doesn't work like a laxative. You're not going to get cramping. You're not going to get diarrhea. You just take a great bowel movement and it's natural and it's healthy. The other thing you can do, um, the other thing I'm sorry that I want to touch base on another thing I was definitely not taught in college. They would have told me to never preach this. I saw it happen constantly at the hospital and it broke my heart. Patient would, I'd get an RD consult to go in and they'd be like, I can't poop. I haven't pooped in three days, five days. I've heard nine days. Um, That's horrible. And while they're eating. So, so this is what I, yeah, that, that's what scares me. So what I want to push right there is if you are constipated to the point where you are not feeling good, your tummy hurts, you feel like people get nauseated, headache, bloated, all these feelings. If you had a clog in your kitchen sink and the water wouldn't drain, would you keep putting food down it? Would you, Whitney? You're, you're a chef. No. Okay, so. It's stop. Stop eating until you have a satisfying bowel movement. It's dangerous. Um, you will not feel better and you keep putting things in, something's off. So this is the one time, unless you're doing a cleanse and that's your cho- you know, decision and we won't even go on that topic. Stop eating solid foods. You might get starving. I get that. So go have a green juice, go get a couple juices to tide you over, go exercise, go on a brisk walk. Walking will help move things, drink warm beverages, even have like a hot glass of water, warm glass of water, with some lemon and honey in it or something, a little apple cider vinegar, whatever, just put liquids in until your body releases and gets rid of that stool that needs to come out of you. Do not keep eating when you are not going to the bathroom. Terrible. I, it, it people get, you know, just they're constipated and then they exacerbate it by eating more and more and more. That's a really good tip. Yeah. Or go get a colonic if you can't wait, you know? Um, and then once you go to the bathroom and you have a great bowel movement and you feel your constipation is starting to resolve itself, that is when you really need to don't wait, start eating more high fiber, high water, rich food, or start taking some type of psyllium or fiber supplement that's natural and healthy to help you keep things moving after that. Don't take fiber supplements when you're constipated either. No, because that's another thing I want to tell people. If you're constipated, don't go take five fiber pills with an eight ounce glass of water. You're going to get more backed up and more gassy. Take the fiber once you had the bowel movement. So you have another. Yes. Got it. Keep things moving. So if people wanted to learn more from you or about you, where can you, where can people go to learn more about you? Well, one day I want to build a website, but I'm not there yet. Super busy. So for now, the best way to get a hold of me, or if you had more questions, which I would love to hear from anybody, um, go to my LinkedIn page. So just message me. And if not, you can go on my Instagram. So it's under Kathleen. Chevalier on LinkedIn and you just type in dietitian Orange County, it will pop up. Um, and I'll put those links um, underneath the YouTube posting of this podcast for perfect. anything to find them. And Whitney, you can put my Instagram name up too. So yeah, please DM me, in, Instagram message me if you want a colonic, if you have a question. Um, I love hearing from people. I love hearing their opinions. And that's another thing I want to stress at the end. If there's one thing I can say, we all have different opinions. So I hope nothing I said offended anyone or anything like that. It's just, these are the thoughts that I have. And based off of the years and years of experience that I have working with people, nutrition, food, and recommending the things that I've talked about definitely help people. And if there's one thing that I could tell everybody, we live in a society that unfortunately has a lot of unreal. When I, when people talk about nutrition, Unfortunately, a lot of the times they're not, I don't think always talking about you and me are, and maybe a lot of our viewers are talking about, I really sincerely want to be healthier, but many people, especially young women and men, I find they want to look perfect. They want their bodies to look a certain way. It's more based around vanity. Yeah. Now, whatever is motivating you to be healthier. Awesome. 
but I want to stress, you don't have to have, you know, Kim Kardashian's body to be healthy. There's lots of thin people that are not healthy. And so make peace with food and respect wherever you are at during your week. This week I was off. I have a new job. I didn't work out for five days. If I had one day, I will totally admit it. I had to go through a Del Taco drive through I hadn't eaten all day long. I was starving. I had a headache and I got a bean and cheese burrito because I was starving. And you know what? Old Katie, 10 years ago, and I'm like, I can't believe I'm eating this. Oh my gosh. And 37 year old wiser Katie goes, it's okay. I'm a hardworking woman that has way too many things that I have to do this week. I didn't have enough time to pack my lunch. It's better than me getting a Western bacon cheeseburger at Carl's, which is next door or Taco Bell, in my opinion. And I'm not going to get the soda or the French fries with it. And it, at least there was some fiber. I looked at the bright side of things and I forgave myself and I ate it and I enjoyed it and I felt nourished. And I went on with my day and I said, this is okay. This is where I'm at today. And I'm doing the best I can. And I went home, I went on a walk and the next day I ate a salad again. So don't beat yourself up about food. Just try to make the best choices you can and just live in the moment. I love beat yourself up <laughs> so much for your honesty and yeah, that knows you and meets you in, per- in person. You have incredible skin. You're always full of energy. Your hair is the most incredible, healthy hair I've ever seen in my life. I did it today because I'm going to a Christmas party tonight. So I made it look real good tonight. <laughs> this amazing, long, luscious, pure virgin hair. She's never colored it. It's stunningly beautiful. Um, Thanks, mom. So, I mean, you're just such a dream to get health and nutrition advice from because so you, you, you really know it and you really live it and you see it from two different angles. You see it from the traditional clinical angle. And then you also see it from a holistic natural angle. And you're really able to find balance between the two, which is what we all need is to find the balance in this modern society that we're living in. Right. It's hard. Balance is hard. I'm not trying to say any of it's easy, but yeah, if anyone ever needs, you know, some encouragement. I am here. And you're so right with me. It's life is life is good, but life is hard. And some days are better than others. And yeah, it's, we just got to keep getting better and give ourselves a break, but try to do the best we can do. And that's all we can do with food and everything else. So can you leave our listeners with one healthy tip they can consider adding into their life from, from Katie, the nutritionist and colon hydrotherapist? If you could do one thing that I believe you could do from any demographic background, time constraints, anything, one healthier thing you could do. I'm going to pick, actually, I'm just going to say the three. Eat a, eat a, eat a colorful fruit or vegetable every day. Mm-hmm. Drink at least your body weight in ounces and water. And even if it's five minutes, give yourself like a five minute walk or stretch every day. I can't do one because one thing's, it, it, we're, yeah, you need to have all of it. You know, we need emotional, spiritual, and physical health. And the walking will help with the mental and the physical and eating the colorful will help with the physical and the emotional, because we all know if we're not nourished well, it can throw us off mentally. So yeah. And sleep, sleep, you know, you don't need money to do any of those four things. You don't need time. You do need time. But if you don't get enough sleep and you don't give yourself something nourishing, you won't have a lot of time anyway. So find the time to do it. You know, we talk about, we just talked about this last time I saw you too. Something I'm really happy that I'm seeing in social media. It doesn't have anything to do with food as they say, stop being proud of being overproductive. I have to beat myself up about that all the time. Stop trying to do 12 hours of work when you have four hours. What you did is enough. So that goes back to take five minutes to take a walk. You always have time. You're not going to get fired because you took a five minute break and went and took a walk outside. Go, you know? So I think it's, those are, those are my, my three, four things. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate your insight and I really had fun chatting with you. 
You too. I always have fun chatting with you. You're my bud. I can't wait to see you again soon. And Thank I'm going to literally as a joke, send you chicken thigh pictures every time I eat them. Buy yeah. this for Christmas gifts. It's amazing. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And um, you have a wonderful week ahead and I look forward to seeing you soon. Me too, Whitney. And thank you everyone for listening. Bye. Bye.